name is Valerie Leonard. I am the founder of Nonprofit Utopia. I want to say thank you so much for joining us, and I want to welcome you. If you're not, if you've not been with us for the past week or so, we are focusing on nonprofit compliance for the month of April. We realize that nonprofits don't pay taxes unless they're paying taxes for their employees. However, we thought that April would be a really good month to focus on compliance. All right, so we have focused at first on the roles of the various players in nonprofits. We have also talked about the role of the IRS in nonprofit compliance. And today we're gonna to focus on the roles of the Attorney General's Office, as well as the Department of Revenue in nonprofit compliance. If you've missed our talks, you can find us on YouTube. All right, so without further ado, I am going to share my screen and then we will talk about compliance, all right? And compliance is one of those things that I find to be um, one of the, an issue that everybody has to deal with at one point or another. It doesn't matter if I'm working with clients on strategic planning, if I'm working with them on fundraising, program development, I find that all roads lead to nonprofit compliance. And we're here today to show you how to get through it. All right, so again, we're gonna be focusing on the roles of the Illinois Attorney General's Office and the Department of Revenue in nonprofit compliance. If you don't live in the state of Illinois, you should go probably to your attorney general's office, or you might have something called the Department of Business Affairs. Any department that regulates your nonprofits, you should go to them and ask them if they have a checklist on all the things that you need to do in order to stay compliant. All right, so we're focusing on the state of Illinois and today we're going to talk about form co1 form co2 the annual report called the ag 990 il and then um, the report that you file for payroll taxes form 941 il and if you recall yesterday when we talked about the role of the irs we also focused on form 941 at the federal level. So those are for federal payroll taxes. Today, we're gonna to be looking at state level payroll taxes. All right, so by way of review, we're gonna talk about the major players in nonprofit compliance. As you can see from this chart, it takes a village in order to maintain nonprofit compliance. And when we talk about compliance, that is basically focusing on reporting issues, making sure that you're in compliance or making sure that you're um, sub subjecting your organization to the requirements of others. Those requirements could be requirements from the federal government, state government, county government, um, from people in the community. So this chart indicates, you know, the major players, and there still could be some beyond this, but these are the major ones. The first one is the nonprofit itself. The board and staff need to make sure that the organization is following all the rules and regulations, not only of the state and federal government, but also for the uh, funders and anyone else with whom they have an arrangement. You know, even nonpliant, uh, com ah, even compliance focuses on your contractual arrangement. So making sure that you do what it is you said that you would do in the first place. All right, so you have obligations also to the Internal Revenue Service, and that really starts from the time that you submit your application, Form 1023, and we talked about that on yesterday. And that role continues with your annual reporting of file of Form 990, as well as your Form 941. Form 990 is filed in lieu of payroll taxes, and Form 941 is where you report your payroll taxes. I'm sorry, Form 990 is in lieu of income taxes. And then the Illinois Department of Revenue, you have to do Form 941 at the state level. 
and then you've got the organization's funders, there are reports that you had to file as an agreement, you know, in return for getting the money, you are held responsible for accounting for how the money was spent. Your organization's auditor will not only audit your books, but he or she will provide technical assistance in preparing your Form 990. They might even prepare it all together. The Illinois Attorney General's Office, you encounter them first during the registration process and then during your annual process, filing form AG990IL. And then the Secretary of State, again, you encounter them when you start your organization and then on an annual basis, filing the annual report. And basically the annual report is letting them know, you know who's still on your board. And then finally, you've got the public. The general public is using the reports that they find right online, such as the Form 990 and any other reports that you might file online and keep on your website. They're using that information to make informed decisions as to whether or not they want to partner with you, as to whether or not they want to continue to fund you. All right. And really, the goal of all of this compliance is not to be punitive, right? But it's actually meant to help you to better manage your organization and be more efficient with your resources. All right. So we're going to get right into the attorney general's role. All right. Right now, we have Kwame Raoul, who is our attorney general, and this is the front page of the attorney general's website. And really, this is drilling down to their, their charitable office, right? So the attorney general's office is focused on um, protecting the state's best interest, protecting the consumer's interest. They regulate all um, charities, they regulate corporations as well. They have a charitable database and that database is a database of every organization that has filed their annual reports with the Attorney General. So if you are an organization that's in operations and you search the database and you find that you're not there, either it's a mistake on their part or more than likely you forgot to uh, register with the attorney general's office all right and remember too there are two agencies that you need to file with on an annual basis in order to maintain good standing one is the attorney general's office you file a an annual report and that report is focused on finances. And then you also have to file on an annual basis with the Secretary of State. The Secretary of State is the office that issues your certificate of good standing. So it is very, very possible for you to be in quote unquote good standing with the state of Illinois and still be out of compliance with the Attorney General's office. So as a rule of thumb, you need to make sure that you file your annual reports with both offices. All right. So the Attorney General's office also regulates nonprofits. So they set the rules and all the statutes that govern the nonprofits. When you start your nonprofit, remember you have to also submit your bylaws, you know, in with your application. And what the IRS does is make sure that those bylaws are consistent with the laws of your state. And in this case, we're talking about the state of Illinois. The Attorney General's Office also provides nonprofit checklists so that you can go through the checklist and make sure that you know what's required when you start a nonprofit and when you register. And speaking of checklists, if you are a member of the Nonprofit Utopia community, we also have a checklist for you. We just posted that in the community so you can go through the checklist and know what's required of you on an annual basis from the state government, from the federal government, as well as from your funders. All right. The Attorney General's Office also um, shares with you some documents that help you understand what the major duties of board members are. And then just so you know, the 
nonprofit utopia youtube channel also has videos on board development that you can check out and take a deeper dive and you will also find on the illinois attorney general's office the nonprofit forms that are required by the illinois attorney general's office and if you are a member of the nonprofit utopia community I just posted a link where you can set up office hours and we can go through all of your compliance issues and we can make sure that you're up to date on all your filings with the state and federal government. All right, so when we look at the Illinois Attorney General's role, you can see that they're the constitutional office that actually represents the state in all of its legal affairs and under law, any fundraiser and charitable organization is going to be required to register and file reports every year with the attorney general's office right and the good thing about this database is in your absence you know people who want to understand more about your organization including potential funders and other stakeholders they can do a search of this database and find out whether or not you're in good standing now, as a nonprofit, you are going to encounter the Attorney General's office in at least two phases of your development. The first phase is when you actually start the organization itself. By law, if you're going to raise funds, you need to be registered with the Attorney General's office. So you are going to register them when you start your organization. I'm sorry, you're going to register with them, right? So you're going to need to file either form CO1 or CO2, and that is for a regular nonprofit, and whether or not you file one or two depends on how long you've been in existence, and we'll go through that. If you are a religious organization, such as a church or some other faith-based type organization, you're going to have to file form CO3. So those forms basically put the put the state of Illinois on notice that you're in existence and then they will begin the compliance process, you know, holding you responsible for filing the reports and making sure that you're doing everything within the bounds of the law. All right. They also support the nonprofit sector. So as I indicated before, they have a number of resources on their website. They have a website that has fillable forms that you can file and submit to them. They have ongoing education. So there are documents that you can download to make sure that you're doing the right thing as it relates to your organization. And then they also provide technical assistance to help you with your reports. Now, I will say this, the technical assistance is going to be somewhat limited because they will also refer you to an attorney in the event that you know some of your questions you know go too far beyond you know just providing information about your financials all right so here is a screenshot of form ag 990 il and this is basically the state of illinois counterpart to form 990 you file this every year and usually the best time to file this is when you're filing your annual audit. So you will work with your auditor or your accountant and you will pull together all the financial information you need to do either an audit or a compilation of your financial reporting. And then at the same time, you're gonna be completing form 990 for the IRS and you'll be filing form AG 990IL for the state. And this report is basically focusing on financial information. All right. So again, you have to do two annual reports for the state of Illinois. One is to the Attorney General, which is Form AG 990IL. The other is to the Secretary of State, which is the annual report. So we're focusing on the Secretary of State, but I just thought this would be a good time to remind you that you have to do annual reports to both entities. So the form AG990IL is due within five and a half months 
of your fiscal year end. So you have your fiscal year end, and then five and a half months later, you have to file your Form 990 and your Form AG990IL. The filing fee is $15 for every return that you file. And if you are late filing, then it's $100. And also, too, I just want to make note, too, that there are a number of organizations that have started, but they're not even aware that they need to file this form. So if you're one of those organizations who has started and you weren't aware that you have filed this form, you are going to need to file this form for every year that you've been in existence, have a filing fee of $15 for every form, and then pay a late fee of $100 for every return. And that's just on the state side. All right. And again, normally you do the form CO1, CO2, and CO3 when you're organizing, you know, when you're starting the organization. But as I said before, there are a number of organizations who don't realize that this information is required. They don't realize that they need to also file with the attorney general's office. They think that just because they file with the secretary of state that they are in compliance. But no, you need to file with the attorney general's office to make sure, one, that they have a record that you are in existence. And that way they can make sure that you are following all the rules as it relates to fundraising. So technically, or actually legally, you're not supposed to even engage in fundraising until after you have filed either form co1 co2 or co3 as i indicated before co1 and co2 those are for standard nonprofits and co3 is for churches and faith-based organizations if your organization is a startup then you file form co1 if your organization has been in existence, you know, you, you have started and you've been operating, right? You file form CO2. Um, and again, this form is to let the state know that you are in existence. It also lets the state know uh, what your financial condition is. So they remember they want to regulate all corporations, including nonprofits. And they will also want to have their finger on the pulse of any fundraising that you're doing. All right, so next up is the Illinois Department of Revenue, right? So this is the front page of the Illinois Department of Revenue's website. And not only do they collect money for income taxes, they also um, are responsible for registration and they also are responsible for, and when I say registration, you have to not only register with the Secretary of State, not only register with the Attorney General's office, but you also have to register your organization with the Department of Revenue. So the, the primary function of the Department of Revenue is to collect taxes and, and fees and any money that comes into the state to be used for a public purpose, right? So this is straight from their website. The primary responsibility of the Department of Revenue is to serve as a tax collection agency for state government and for local governments. So our cities also send uh, tax money to the state. The department also administers the state's lottery and regulates the manufacturer distribu distribution and sale of alcoholic beverages. And the department also oversees local property tax assessments and functions as the funding agent for the Illinois Department in uh, Illinois Housing Development Authority. So basically, again, the only thing you're concerned with at this point as a nonprofit is any fees that you need to uh, pay to them. So you need to be concerned with the Department of Revenue when you are starting out registering your business and that business includes nonprofits you need to also interface with them when you're filing for tax exempt status so that when you file for sales um, for tax exempt status 
you can also start putting the ball in motion so you can get exemption from sales tax and you need to do that report on an annual basis you also interface with the department of revenue when you pay state payroll taxes and when you pay state unemployment taxes all right and the department of revenue also you know they're interested in supporting the nonprofit sector as well so they have fillable forms that you can file online to make things more convenient in fact everything has gone online in the age of covid they provide ongoing education and public awareness campaigns and they also provide technical assistance to help you complete those forms all right so this is the screenshot of reg one this is the paper that you need to file when you start your nonprofit. if you have not started your nonprofit, or i'm sorry if you have started your nonprofit, even if you've been in business for years and have never filed this form you need to file this form so that you know one they know that you're in existence and know how to assess any taxes that you might incur all right so that could be you know knowing that you incur payroll taxes or unemployment taxes and all that good stuff but the key thing here is to register it you can go to the illinois business gateway and register your nonprofit. all right you also interface again with the illinois department of revenue after you get your tax exempt status so really you need to be you know in contact with them while you're developing your nonprofit. and there is a form you can file online and you will uh, file it and you'll provide your articles of incorporation your bylaws your irs letter of determination so that's the, the letter that you get from the irs to show that you are tax exempt. You'll have to show the most recent financial statement and religious organizations like churches don't have to share their financial statements. You also need to have a brief narrative that explains the purposes, functions, and activities of your organization and any marketing collateral. So they wanna know, you know that this organization is in existence, it's an ongoing concern and also to if your nonprofit is in the business of economic development, you're going to have a very, very, very hard time getting exemption from sales taxes. You know, I, I guess there's a philosophical argument that suggests that, you know, if your business is promoting the creation <clears throat> of taxes for the city and state, then you should not necessarily be exempt you should also be paying into the till all right so if you are renewing again you need to do this on an annual basis if you want to be exempt from sales tax so once you go through the process for the first time you're going to be issued an e99 number so you're going to have a letter with your e99 number and that number is going to be um, exclusively for your organization kind of like a tax id number but for sales taxes then you'll include a copy of your articles of incorporation and if you're not a corporated entity then you'll have a copy of your constitution you'll need a copy of your bylaws a copy of your irs letter claiming your federal tax exempt status so that's your letter of determination any brochures and the most recent financial statement. And they're cautioning you don't provide a bank statement, but your financial statement. So that is your income statement that'll have how much money coming in and how much money goes out. All right, so finally you as a nonprofit, if you have employees, you're going to encounter the State Department of Revenue with with respect to payroll taxes for your employees so you have to file form illinois 941 and you could do that on an annual basis or a quarterly basis but i strongly strongly 
suggest that you do it on a quarterly basis. And I even strongly suggest that even if you have a have one person on your payroll that you get an outside payroll service to do these forms for you because it can be very, very cumbersome, even though they look simple. And when I say cumbersome, the cumbersome aspect is not so much in filing it, but it's the consequences of not filing them properly and all the taxes and fees and penalties that can come into play. All right. So if you paid wages, salaries, or gambling winnings, hopefully that doesn't necessarily apply to your nonprofit, you're subject to withholding. So anybody who is subject to withholding or you're withholding earnings, then you have to file Form 941. And it's due on a quarterly basis. So it's due within 30 days of the end of each quarter. So at the end of first quarter, the first quarter ends in March. So 30 days after March 31st, you have to file your quarterly 941. So again, you need to, at least I would recommend that you get an outside service to manage your payroll and they will file that form for you. All right. So if you have been notified by the state of Illinois that you're an annual filer, you have to do this on an annual basis by January 31st of the year end of the calendar. So after 30, after December 31st. However, like I said, I would not recommend you doing this on an annual basis. I would recommend that you do it on a quarterly basis. I would recommend too that you have an automatic ser a service that will do this for you. And they will actually pull from your bank account, not on a quarterly basis, but on a monthly basis and have those, those uh, funds and escrow and ready to pay for you on a quarterly basis. All right, and these penalties, these are the penalties for late filing the payroll taxes at the state level. If you missed yesterday, you should watch our video on the IRS role in compliance. I did talk about what some of the penalties and there are steep, very steep penalties at the federal level. In fact, they're so steep that a number of businesses, if they've gotten behind in their payroll taxes, you know, just the penalties and interest alone were enough to put them out of business. So it's no joke getting behind with your payroll taxes and your filing. All right, so you will owe, and this is at the state level, um, the penalty. So on top of any penalties you have to pay at the federal level, you may have to pay penalties at the state level if you have not filed at the state level as well. So you owe a late penalty if you don't file a processable return. So when we say processable, that means a return that doesn't have any errors in it. It has sufficient information so that they can determine how much you owe and you know check your numbers right so if you don't file a processable return by the due date and the, remember the due date is within 30 days of the quarter you will not only have to pay the light late <clears throat> penalty right but you can also incur you know other um, fees for example a bad check penalty you know if your check bounces that's $25 on top of that, right? So there's a penalty for late filing as well as a penalty for uh, late payment. So for late filing, there are two tiers. The first tier is the lesser of $250 or 2% 2 of the tax required to be shown due on that particular return. So again, we're looking at the quarterly return. And if you by any chance have any payments or any credits that are already in your account, then it gets offset or reduced by the amount that is already in your account. If the return is timely filed out, filed, right? So you filed on time, but you made some mistakes such that it can't be processed, you'll have 30 days to make the correction, right? And then tier two, is if you don't file a return within 30 days after receiving a notice of non-filing, on top of that tier one penalty, you're going to 
get a penalty equal to the greater of $250 or 2% of the tax shown due. The additional penalty can't be more than $5,000 and the penalty will be assessed even if there's no tax due. So remember there are penalties for not filing as well as penalty for not payment. So on top of those penalties we just talked about for not filing, the penalty for late payments could be 2% if you're one to 30 days late, 10% if you're more than 31 days late. And remember that's on top of any fees that you've paid to the federal government as it relates to as it relates to payroll. All right. So at this point, if there are any comments, any questions, I will take those comments and questions. I don't see any comments or questions. I wanna say thank you so much for joining us. This video will be on our YouTube page and you can refer to it. If you have any questions, if you have any comments, you can email me at Valerie F. Leonard at nonprofitutopia.com. Thanks for watching. Take care. Bye-bye.